Welcome to War the Rebellion podcast for H Civil War. I am guest host Andrew Hauck, a PhD candidate in France at University of Malta. I am here with uh, Niels Eichhorn, uh, independent scholar who has written uh, such books as Liberty and Slavery, European Separatists, Southern Secession, and the American Civil War, and Duncan A. Campbell, who is professor of history at National University in San Diego, and the author of Unlike the Allies, Britain, America, and the Victorian origin, Origins of uh, the Special Relationship. We're here today to talk about their book uh, from LSU Press came out, is coming out right now, uh, called Civil War in the Age of Nationalism. So guys, welcome. It's Thank great you. to be talking to you both. Thanks for having Great us, Andrew. Um, so this is a, an amazingly long, it's an amazingly dense project. Um, Were you so, going to call us long? No, 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 no. It's a, it, it's a very, uh, the, the project is very, very deep. Um, mm -hmm. And you cover lots and lots of topics. Um, there's no way we can talk about everything uh, this evening. There's just, there's, there, there, there are too many too many details, too many, too much. The scope is too vast. But um, I had uh, got a lot of questions for you. Um, we can't get to them all. Some are general, some are specific. Um, so let's let's kind of get started. Um, uh, the very first question I had, uh, the epigraph, dedication. You dedicate it to. You dedicate your book to Philip Earl Myers, who died yeah. in 2017. Yeah. So the very first thing that I thought when I when I when I saw that epigraph was um, this book is only coming out in 2024, which means it was in progress in 2017. Mm -hmm. So seven years ago. How long did it take you to produce this volume from I guess the germination of the idea uh, to to final publication. Um, okay, well, germination. Um, this has been percolating for years, certainly for me, and I know Niels has had some of these ideas in his head as well, because obviously they've come out in conversations. Um, but I just give you an idea of the background. I was invited by Schaffer. Uh, historians of American foreign relations on the 150th anniversary of the Civil War to write a roundtable to participate in a roundtable, the Civil War in you know global context. And some of the ideas in this book, just very, very broadly, were just pounded out in a 250 word post. And you know, I drew a fair amount of Carl Daigler's earlier work. And so um, anyway, it got good response. Uh, quite a number of people enjoyed my post and the other people's posts. And then H. My, uh, T. Michael Parrish from LSU Press contacted me and asked me if I was working on this. Was I turning this into a book or something? Hmm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, was a short answer, but I could. But I wasn't going to be doing this on my own. Hmm. I needed someone to work with. And that was, Niels was an obvious choice. We'd already knew each other earlier. And this is where um, um, Phil comes into the picture. We met through Phil because Phil had an interest in the American Civil War in a global context. Now he was more Anglo-American relations diplomacy, but he was very much aware of the wider world in which the American Civil War took place. And there's Phil's book, Washington Cooperation, which I, rec I obviously can't recommend highly enough. Anyway, so Niels and I had already been talking about, you know, the Civil War in a global context, but these were just, you know, normal, you know, just shoot the breeze kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. So that's when I approached him and said, okay, look, you know, we've, there's this offer to write the book. We've been talking about this, not as a book, just as ideas. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, we met at a conference and then we actually hammered out the big picture for the book. And then that was it. Uh, we got back in touch with LSU Press. Yeah, we can do it, Mike. Um, and it's just there's going to be co-authors. 
And this is, here's our prospectus. Here's how we do it. Got the green light and that's where it went. Okay. In terms of actually writing it from contract. So to, that was, yeah. that, that was 2011 ish. No, 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 no. 20, no, 2014, 2015. Okay, so time, so time had passed. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. No, Niels and I have known each other. Lord, how long have we known each other? <laughs> Somewhere uh, around 2010, I would say. Yeah, somewhere around there. So, I mean, yeah. this is, as I say, but the, we actually probably began around 2015, 2014, depends okay. what you do, do day from the contract or when you were drawing up the plans for it. Took us about six years, I think, to write total. Mm -hmm. But then there was a peer review process, you know, rewriting in response to that. So it's, because, it's basically... Eight years officially, probably stretching into almost ten unofficially. Yeah. Okay. If you do all the discussions we had before we before we turned to a book. So there you go, about a decade. Yeah. Well, uh, and it's the, definitely. The scope of, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Nick. No. I was going to say I, I always remember when I, I had an interview with the uh, uh, Browning and I uh, forget the other guys' his name for Civil War Environmental History, and they did their kind of idea on a napkin at a baseball game so we don't have that beautiful story but we during the panel session that neither one of us was very interested in we sat down and we like hammered out like this chapter would be good this chapter would be good and um i want to say either reconstruction or memory were late additions in the writings that we did i don't mm -hmm. remember which one exactly it was but <clears throat> we 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 very quickly agreed that also I think it was very obvious from the from that moment that we met and it was in High Point at the um, consortium of the Revolutionary Era meeting that the structure that you see in the book is the structure we were going to go for. Okay, that, um, like there yeah, was there yeah. was a little curveball that that went through at the very end about changing the organization, but. The organization was pretty much from the start set. That yeah. that's how we wanted to proceed. Okay. Um, well, that that answers my question because uh, the the scope uh, of the book is 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 just is enormous, um, and I, I can't imagine it's taken me. I'm in seven years of working on my dissertation. It's not done, and that's on one subject. I can't imagine working on on such such a transnational global history um, of, it's not only a history of, of politics and religion, it's a history of ideas. So you guys are going back, way back into the early modern period and bringing it up in some cases to contemporary history. Sure. So it would have surprised me if this had taken less than six or seven years at the very least, I will still yeah. blame Duncan for the early modern. Yeah, uh, that's Neil's a more modernist. Some of it, though, it was you know, I mean, the focus of the book is really the about the eighteen forties to eighteen seventies. That's where most of the book takes place. But the trouble is, some of these issues, like the nation state, well, I didn't know there was a. And this is a thing. There are a lot of things I didn't know until I started doing the research for this book. I didn't know there were people who are actually arguing that no, the nation state actually came into existence in the medieval period. So, okay, I can't get into that. So I just reference it in a single sentence. Then there's a footnote, and you can contend with the medievalists. I'm not going to. But some of the topics were just, were just, yeah, they were just, you realize they were just much bigger. A lot of stuff was a lot less settled than you thought. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a 19th century historian. That's where I focus. You know, it's it's sort of I in some areas was also working outside of my wheelhouse, realizing a lot of these nineteenth century ideas were building upon much older ideas. And you're trying to trace the pedigree of them. Well, of course, I mean you um, when you're talking about defining terms of uh, liberalism, um, nationalism, um, liberal liberalism especially, you go back to the Glorious Revolution, you go back to go back to Hobbes, you go back to Locke. Um, yeah. Well, I think the challenge there too is that it's 
it so much depends on the region you're in, right? Like we we talk very elaborately, or I guess that was Duncan's contribution to the book about like the Scottish versus the continental European origins of of liberalism and yeah. representative government and what what does this all entail? How does this like what what do people want when they say we want a liberal state, right? It's like like today I, I I'm pretty sure that there will be if we go to popular kind of audiences, there will be some pushback of like what liberal state? I don't like liberal state, but it's like that's, that's the a, state yeah. we live in. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. our state. That's yeah. like conservative state is a monarchy. That's that's the reality of it at, in the nineteenth century, you know? Well, um, and then uh that was one of my uh we, we talked about this on on Twitter. Uh it, it's it's refreshing to see the word liberal used in its original context talking about an american history subject which yeah. is typically yeah. a word i think that's one of these buzzwords that um scholars tend to avoid well it was in large part our mm -hmm. goal to be very cautious mm -hmm. with the word choices we make because um i mean it, it it's part of my pet peeve when it comes to like people are doing this conflation of republicanism and democracy and it's like in the 19th century that's two very different subjects like when right. a person in britain says i i want democracy hands go up and they're like no 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 we don't want everyone to have the right to vote <laughs> um republicanism on the other hand that people are more amenable to that so it's and i think that's our modern modern mind frame reading it back into the past often that we kind of have this like oh this is what we think of today and then we put that on to people in the past i mean i it always reminds me of that age of jackson book by arthur schlesinger and you you read through that and you're kind of like okay you're reading the new deal into jackson's period and it right. doesn't work you know like yeah i mean that i mean one the else knows this my pet peeve is the word democracy um we, I mean, when we, we just use democracy, we're talking more or less about the liberal state, universal suffrage now, but with bills of rights and all that. I mean, what the way we use democracy now in our modern, you know, discussions, democracy is a great thing as opposed to democracy. It just didn't, it wasn't read that way back in the 19th century. Okay. Even like, like people like Lincoln, who's usually held up as a democratic hero, avoided the word like the plague, both in public discourse and even privately. He doesn't use the word democracy. He uses terms like popular government, republics, but he will not try to find Lincoln using the word democracy. He really doesn't use it. It's just to be avoided. Well, but then you talk about, in, in the book, you talk about Andrew Jackson as well with the Democratic yeah. Party. Yeah. Not using the word democracy. Doesn't use either. the word either, no. It's, it's 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 interesting, and then it's, and in Britain, it's the same way. The Chartists who want universal male suffrage don't use the word democracy. It doesn't appear anywhere in the People's Charter. Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting how this, and you know, we also point out Alexis de Tocqueville doesn't actually provide a solid definition for it in his Democracy in America. Mm -hmm. There's You can read how de Tocqueville uses democracy several different ways. And it's just these terms like liberal and so forth, they get bandied around. Mm -hmm. They get used improperly either because, as Neil said, we're imposing our present day usage of the term back on the past. And it's also just the experience that people have um, that with democracy itself. It's interesting that I, I'm trying to remember it was one of the British liberals at the very end of the 19th century is Lord Bryce, 1880s, says in Britain, democracy means the French Revolution and the terror. Sure which we, you know, we just don't make that assumption. Yeah. Well, and when you look into like the mid-19th century, we didn't cover that in the book, but when you look at British debates in the mid-19th century, mm -hmm. as soon as there's franchise reforms being debated in Britain, it's like, ooh, no, we don't want to be like the U.S. We don't want that corruption. We don't want that yeah. fraud mm -hmm. that U.S. democratic, quote-unquote, elections are associated with because... We don't want to end up like that country over there. So it's like it's this like, really weird thing where so many, so much scholarship you sometimes see. It's like, who's the United States beacon of everything? And many contemporaries in Europe were like, 
they weren't hostile to the United States. They were just like skeptical. They were like, hmm, we hmm. see what really happens, not what you want us to see really happens. And but they're... Even... But no, I was just saying, but even people like John Stuart Mill, right, who isn't in any way anti-American, okay, he, he doesn't like democracy really at all. John Stuart Mill believes society should be guided by an intellectual elite containing men like himself. The purpose of the great unwashed is more or less to rubber stamp the elite's decisions. It's, there's, it's a real, it's, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, just this term democracy and representative government, it's, they're actually very interesting terms and they're bandied about very often incorrectly when we look at this past. Well, and then there there are lots of presuppositions about um, about democracy, what what it entailed. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that I'm guilty of, and this is you know, uh, is assuming that um, there was essentially universal male suffrage in the United States by the time of the Civil War. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, if you exclude African Americans, sure. Yeah. But was it, yeah. I mean, even, what did you say? It was in the 1890s when uh, there was. Yeah, I forget the exact details there. But yeah, it's when you, when you think of it, like I always think of the age of Jackson, right? And the That's right. that we think of like, oh, more states are going for democracy. Like the, the property qualifications are removed and people have the right to vote like we elect the electors for presidential elections popularly. And of course, South Carolina being the exception to it. But in places like New York and Massachusetts and others, African-Americans who had the right to vote lose it because of racial um, qualifications that are now put in place. So it's this, this whole period is sort of, it's unwickish. It's, it's like, it, it's, filled with paradoxes and steps backwards and it's like it's, a it's weird... also it's it's also the secret ballot the absence yeah. of the secret ballot makes voting hazardous even for those who do have it yeah. it varies from place to place but some of these elections are shows of hands in public places mm -hmm. and we make the point in britain you've got landlords watching their tenants to make sure they vote the right way with eviction as a consequence yeah. for delinquents. In the US, it can be literally guys standing there with billy clubs, making sure you vote the right way. I, it, it's actually quite staggering how this, yeah, you may have the right to vote in theory, but that be, having the right to vote doesn't mean you get to vote for who you want to vote for. Those are two different things. Mm -hmm. And it, weird thing is 19th century reformers see this. It doesn't matter American, German, French, they see this. They see, you know, the people being leaned on that people are not actually freely exercising the franchise, and they comment on this quite loudly and quite frequently. They're not they're not oblivious to this. So, you t in your book, you talk about the Australian ballot as mm -hmm. being uh, a euphemism for for uh, uh, a secret ballot. Mm -hmm. Did did that idea? Where did it come from? What, why did Australians start using a a secret ballot? Was it I mean, it's a, it seems so simple looking yeah, back. Yeah, it's, I mean, as far as I was able to determine, it came originally from British Chartists who had the problem of landlords watching them vote. A lot of these guys got transported to Australia as punishment for being Chartists, being involved in voting. So the idea then took root in Australia. But Australia, like the United States, is a frontier society. It was often very rough and ready. And fraud and intimidation and polls in Australia took place. So the Australians pioneered it, and then people began to realize what a great idea this was. But to be fair, there were American reformers calling for the, calling for the secret ballot as early as the 1850s. But once it was implemented somewhere else, proved successful, then you the arguments against it disappear. Mm -hmm. There's also ideas of 19th century ideas of honor and masculinity, okay? That you should have the, you know, the guts, the character to stand up and state where you stand on a political issue. Like there is a sense the secret ballot's a bit sneaky. Mm -hmm. Like uh, with a secret ballot, you could be saying you're a Republican or a Democrat and actually vote for the other party. Well, that's a bit underhanded, no. 
where's the honor in that? I mean, th there's a lot of these antiquated, well, antiquated, that's me talking in the 21st century, no, antiquated, yeah. of like as a man stands for his opinions, stands tall, gives his, you know, states where he stands. The trouble is, of course, <laughs> that can sometimes be very risky. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Well, uh, in that, uh, Niels, you wanted to say something? No, I kind of, in part, it felt like I, it sort of reminded of sort of the, um, of emancipation too, right? Like once in the British Caribbean, it's like the counter example to Haiti, right? Like, ooh, emancipation can happen peacefully. It doesn't have to be a violent, murderous revolution. Ooh, well, you know, now, now we open the floodgates and that's, it. it's, somebody has to try things and then all of a sudden it's like, ooh, yeah, we can do that too. And that yeah. that's oftentimes what you have, right? With these sort of comparisons mm -hmm. that somebody tries and ooh, yeah. others mimic or imitate or yeah. unintentionally do it because they come to the same conclusion independently. Yeah. Hmm. So um how would you define liberalism then? Oh. Just in general. You you know, that that liberalism. Let's say for <laughs> let's say uh someone today who um has a very a very clear idea of what a liberal what liberal means, how would you define it in terms that would um in terms that would do justice to its nineteenth century meaning? I'm going to let you take a step at that. First. Yeah, okay. I mean, all right, we're talking from the 19th century perspective. Fundamentally, liberalism is about rights. Mm -hmm. And it's it's heavy. It's heavy, but not entirely on individual rights. That said, very few 19th century liberals did not understand, did not have the idea of obligation to the wider community. Oh. So it, it, even like John Stuart Mill is often considered a extreme liberal in certain individualism that's not actually true uh, like you can read what uh, john stuart mill's recommendation was for delinquent fathers um because of the burden they place on society so but there so it's the strange in the 19th century is a set of individual rights but also obligations to your wider community in which you exist and it's not necessarily and the rights are usually surround property that's one thing that is very big on 19th century liberals is that, you know, you own your labor, you own your property. And generally, you're supposed to have, use this term advisedly, freedom of conscience. You are supposed to be able to articulate ideas freely with a minimum amount of coercion. On the other hand, there's plenty of 19th century liberals who think blasphemy laws are a good idea. So don't <laughs> be careful. <laughs> the free speech is not, you know... There, I've not on, I've not seen 19th century. There must be one somewhere. I've never seen 19th century liberal who thought pornography was acceptable. Mm. In fact, uh, with Mill, James Fitzjames Stephen actually criticized Mill, saying that his ideas would basically legalize obscenity, which Mill, of course, denies outright. But it's it is this focus on rights. It's actually not so much a focus on right to vote as a focus on protections but individual protections that that's my view of the 19th century liberal Neil, if you want to pitch in yeah i was going to say in in large part i i agree with almost everything you're saying there because i think it's for the 19th century a liberal is somebody who who is very conscientious about rights um, especially property rights are of great importance to them um kind of a constitutional form of government in some form that outlines obligations as well as rights in some mm -hmm. form like limitations of what what a sovereign can do to you because uh, liberalism does not mean that you can't have a monarchy you can mm -hmm. um, and i think the other big one is that it has some form of representation in the system embedded right that it's like it's yeah. a a consent of the government that in some form is there whether that it's an elected parliament but I don't say I I would caution in that it's not perceived as a democracy. I don't think a liberal would think of 
every man or every person having the right to vote. They would be much more willing to restrict who has the right to vote because they they do have sort of a bit of a mistrust towards um, mm -hmm. workers or uneducated individuals or outsiders, whatever that may mean for them. Yes, that's because it's true also in the US, literacy tests are actually yeah. still in stand in early 19th century America. Yeah. Like you, you in order to exercise, you may be a white male, but in order to exercise a vote, you better be able to demonstrate you can read and write. Yeah. That's that's a that's actually a classical 19th century liberal idea. Mm -hmm. That you actually have to understand the issues before you can have a say on them. Yeah. So paupers, for instance, no, they don't get the vote. It's there's they don't they don't have any stake in the wider society. They don't own, they're not property owners, they don't pay tax. Mm -hmm. They don't and contribute they, to society. They, yeah. 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 And so it, it's they're a much more restrictive view. It's funny though, the liberal idea of the rights is the one that's really it's seems to be the most contentious, actually, mm -hmm. because all our politics seems to come down to rights more than anything else. Yeah. I'm not really aware of anybody arguing against people being allowed to vote. That sort of, I mean, there may be some exceptions, but not really. But the rights is where we, in our contemporary world, we still are the one where the, that's where the clash happens rather than the actual exercise of the franchise. There is actually, I would actually say, yes, there is still debate because I ran into a representative in Georgia who actually kind of, Underhandedly, okay. he, he elected official right. in the state of Georgia who okay. literally kind of made the claim in a forum about the election that, you know, not yeah. everyone probably should have the right to vote because they don't know what they're voting for. Okay. I, okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. But I would say that's not it's, something you generally announce in public. I mean, this yes. seems to me that know, was stupid. It, yeah, no, I just it's unusual to hear that. Yeah. Whereas rights, that's what we always seem to contest. Yes. You know, I agree. with any contemporary issue, that seems like abortion, yeah. for instance. Rights, rights, that's where it comes down to. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, in, in, along the same lines, and this is a term that's not ever mentioned in your in your book, but the, the idea of citizenship. Mm -hmm. mm. What is a citizen and what is citizenship? When did... Uh, yeah. people start becoming citizens and part of the body politic and, and well I mean that's what a, is a big citizen? big challenge because <laughs> with the monarchies it was the idea initially of subject right you're born you're born subject to this king and um, most monarchies believed that you never shed that identity right you're you're always like you might move to another kingdom but you're still subject to this this monarch that yeah. you were born under um, causes huge controversies when the United States comes about and creates this naturalization process where you can become, through immigration, mm -hmm. settling a citizen of the United States. And I mean, we have the War of 1812 <laughs> over that yeah. in part. Um, there's conflicts between the German states, Prussia in particular, where military service is a requirement in the United States uh, until I think it's 1867 when they finally have a naturalization agreement finally hammered out or Maybe it was 1870. Um, so it's it's a hugely contentious subject. Um, but the trouble is, put... yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. it's a fair point. We could have discussed it, although mm -hmm. there's a lot of things we could have discussed here. <laughs> the trouble with citizenship, the trouble with citizenship, though, for instance, it predates liberalism and democracy. Yeah. The nation it, state. It, the, the, Vene the Venetian Republic had citizens, yeah. and that's it's a republic, but it's not really a democracy at all. And to what rights Venetian citizens have? Well, you know, they, I mm -hmm. suppose they have, they have some that non-Venetians don't have. But it's this is the problem. The word citizen, you know, it's one of these words that bounces around. And my understanding was actually it's a French Revolution, citoyen, where the word citizen really, really gets this intellectual. Mm -hmm. Um, have to it, I think even more so than, what, than the American Revolution. Yeah. Um, but then I would say that's one thing I think comes across in our book, the French Revolution. Everybody is still trying to react to that in the 19th mm -hmm. century. Yeah. I think this is also true in America. This seems to be one of the big, 
I, and I'm one of these historians who believes that the English speaking world, in this case, I'm just including the United States and Britain, still tends to underrate how important the French Revolution was to our political systems. Mm. Europeans, the continental Europeans, have no problem understanding this, but I do think it's interesting the English speaking world kind of overlooks the French Revolution almost in terms of its impact upon our societies. Um, because it's, yeah, I see the 19th century, much of it is really into reaction of what happened in France and then with Napoleon. I think there's a big, that is actually what seems to focus a lot of people's minds. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. Well, and I think when you think of like the birth of the modern nation state, that is the French Revolution, right? That's right. Uh, it's the French army that spreads this notion of like the citizen soldier, the um, consent of the govern, the um, yeah. the French nation to Italy, and the Italians are like, no, no, we're not French citizens, <laughs> we're Italian citizens, we're we're an right. Italian nation, and start thinking in those terms. The Germans like that. Um, uh, what is it, Fossler's narrative of like the invasion of Russia, the Leipzig and then Waterloo and the yeah. growth of that German identity. And um, like, uh, we look at the Civil War as part of that because the Civil War yeah. is not like people are a person is a U.S. citizen, but they're also part of a state identity. So like what identity comes first here, right? Like. I mean, we talked about this very briefly, and I kind of wish we'd talk more about it, but a lot, again, there are a lot of things I'd like to talk more about. That battle between Calhoun and Webster, okay, about whether the United States is a compact among the states or no, whether or not there's this creature called the American and this identity transcends other states. This is like, these debates are being replicated elsewhere. That's just the American take on this debate about, you know, national identity, um, yeah versus like state identity what's the difference between the nation and the state and the americans are trying to you know figure this out so is everybody else yeah um yeah. and they don't really they actually don't really figure it out in a lot of ways i think that's someone to make clear it's it's it it this goes on into the 20th century yeah hmm. well i mean well, you, you see it in france too right like yeah. The, the, yeah is there a french nation maybe but people in alsace or lorraine or breton or long uh, long dog think of himself versus that region and speaks that dialect you know, or you know looking at garibaldi i mean <laughs> yeah, garibaldi is born in a, a place that is now france yes right. yes thanks napoleon the third and cavour yeah that's it yeah so uh in speaking of the french revolution um one thing i found interesting reading this um mm -hmm. in terms of idea the ideological background of liberalism and uh, the birth of the age of nationalism and, and uh, you trace it back to Locke and Hobbes, mm -hmm. um, Scott, the Scottish Enlightenment. Yes. Um, there was not much mention of the French Enlightenment, which I found to be surprising. Yeah. Given the importance of the French Revolution. Um, Well, this is the point. I mean, I, I did emphasize this. I relied on Helena Rosen, Rosenblatt, you know, was, made some pointers here. And I think partly it was because I was trying to focus on this, trying to get away from this idea of the Anglosphere and start trying to say, well, it's really an entire Western world, Atlantic world, whatever you want to call it. I mean, I do talk about Ellen Rosenblatt says, no, liberalism is invention, the French Revolution, and she identifies the main thinkers. And I, I more or less agree with her, but I say, sure, but, you know, there's a reason we focus on some of these Anglo thinkers as well, because they're part of this process. Mm -hmm. Could have said more about the French Enlightenment, absolutely, but I don't even really say with the, that much about the British Enlightenment. I just make the point that, I mean, I more or less agree with Rosenblatt. I'm not sure liberalism is invented by Locke at all, but I'm just pointing out in the 17th century, some of these ideas are coming into existence. Yes. Yeah. It's, well, it's more a dialogue amongst these national groups. Yeah. All of these thinkers, they're also aware of each other. That's one thing I try to hammer home here is they're aware of each other. Like they read each other's work, usually in French, and they're aware, you know, that somebody in Scotland has said this. They're aware that somebody in Paris said this. And, you know, they also are aware of German thinkers too. They're, they're aware of each other. There is no English speaking world 
where everything is hived off. I mean, I could have made much more about Jefferson's Francophilia, for instance, mm -hmm. which I was not really talking about the early national period. We're in the Civil War period. That's kind of the issue. But yeah. yeah. That's but I think point. also in part was that the audience we were writing towards was more going to be familiar with Hobbes and Locke and individuals sure. from the Scottish Enlightenment so that well, we kind of so, set something up that you know and then we're going to start tearing those things down. Okay, so then the the big question here is who is the intended audience for your book? Uh, ooh, good the, question. Okay, right? yeah, my the 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 first the first, the first instance I'm a Civil War scholar. It's from my fellow Civil War historians. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going for first. Um, because it's, I've just been working in this field for a long time, ever since my first, actually my first publication was a collection of primary sources in the Civil War, okay, which I did an edit collection with my old department chair, John Roper in Swansea. It's actually interesting how Civil War historians just don't really, there are exceptions, of course, but Civil War historians just don't, aren't that interested in where the Civil War fits in with all the other conflicts that are going on. And the fact that these conflicts, the argument, the debates about these conflicts are actually impacting upon the American Civil War and the American Civil War is part of this process. I found that very interesting. So this is, yes, I am, Niels is, we're trying to globalize the American Civil War. Understand that this is actually part of an international process it's interconnected with all these other issues going on. It's not some, it's all historical events are unique, but they're not exceptional. What's well, going on in America is being replicated abroad. Sorry, go on, Neil. No, I, I, I was just going to add to that. It's that, and we, we were singing broadly. I mean, there, we're not talking to the five people alive that are working on the Civil War in international context or mm -hmm. twin people that. <laughs> our lives yeah. that like do that today right um we also know that some of those may not want to read our book based on things we will be saying it that we're saying in it but it, it i think the other aspect to this is to kind of not just talk to civil war historians to kind of think beyond sort of like the water's edge right of the mm -hmm. I like to say of the united states but also the more general audience right that's why that's in part why we organized books the way we did and included so many different facets mm -hmm. to kind of be like, you know, you might not in be interested in military history. You might be interested mm -hmm. in religious history and with regard to mm -hmm. the United States. We have a chapter for you. You might not be interested in imperialism. <laughs> we have something on, you know, memory or political organization. Um, so we hopefully we'll see how that goes but hopefully there's something that everyone can find interesting in this right whether you're a religious scholar in the u.s whether you're a military scholar whether you're a gender historian race historian um, that's that's why we wanted to it, as Dan has already met, said many times here it's it's impossible to do everything right that's mm -hmm. Uh, we want this as sort of a, I think we talked about it privately a few times that we were like, you mm -hmm. know, this is a conversation starter. Mm -hmm. right? This is sort of the hors d'oeuvre. The big meal is still coming because it should jumpstart a conversation. So are, are there any pre, let's say prerequisites now? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so is... You study, uh, you have, uh, Niels, you, you were from Germany, you have a, a, a German, you had a German upbringing. Uh, Duncan, as, we, as we've, we've said, uh, you've had a, a global upbringing as well. I live in France. Um, we have um, kind of a unique perspective, through the three of us. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, in what ways, um, does our unique perspective prepare us for this book that an average reader of the American Civil War might not have? 
Ooh. Okay. Um, Sorry, that was a t that's a toughie. No, no. Well, I mean, well, I start with we have. I mean, and this is always a concern when you do this. In most cases, we have tried to provide basic background sketches of what was going on. Hmm. So we don't give you an entire history of Italian unification, but we talk about what was going on at the time, very briefly, broad strokes, because it's so that you are, you get this. Um, and we talk about what's going on the countries at the time, you know, what is going on in the personnel at the time, their worldviews and whatnot. So that if, for instance, French, and you really don't know anything about Lord Palmerston, you get some ideas about Lord Palmerston in here, what he did, what he believed. Um, so, I mean, I think we've been, that perspective is there. Cool. In terms of our background, I'm sure that, I'm sure that with all three of us having lived abroad, I'm sure that certainly has an impact on our perspective. Mm -hmm. And I do think, sure, this book for Niels and I are both, it comes out of partly Neither of us are American, or Niels is actually. Niels is now a nationalized American citizen, but neither of us were born in the United States. Neither of us were raised there. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like we came to the U.S. with background information about the wider world. Mm -hmm. That said, there's plenty of Americans who have an interest in the wider world. You're an example. And of course, Carl Daigler, who, as we admit, in some ways sparked off this, also had an interest in the wider world. There's always been Americans who are curious about abroad and travel abroad. So, I mean, I think if, if you have any interest in the wider world, what's going on in the 19th century, this book should appeal to you in some way or another. But I also say with like, even with Europeans, European history's gotten better and it's less national based. It looks more at Europe. I mean, even British history, I, it, when I was being taught it, apparently Europe had no impact on Britain after the Tudors. Okay. <laughs> Modern British history doesn't do that anymore. It's It's been more Europeanized, okay? Um, but even so, Europe is only one part of the world. Mm -hmm. A lot of the ideas that are being discussed in Europe are being discussed on the other side of the Atlantic. For And the culture, the culture comp, for instance, in Germany, if you're a German scholar, you know about that. It may be a surprise to realize there was something similar going on in the U.S., with the drive to get the Catholic Bible out of the public schools. The Ulysses S. Uh, Grant was a big supporter of the Kulturkampf in Germany. That may come as a surprise that you know, people abroad saw what was going on in Germany and were like, yes, that's the way to go. Um, yeah, because there were British admirers of Bismarck too. And yes, you know, because sectarian Protestantism is a real thing in the 19th century world. And all the Protestant countries, even if they don't get on, they have this sectarian element about them that when they see this sort of thing, they applaud each other. Mm -hmm. Because we all know the Roman Catholic Church is a force of darkness in the world, apparently. <laughs> this is the kind of thing where you should actually, as a reader, you should have given, I was being sarcastic, by the way. I don't call it, I'm living the it. Point, I didn't want to make that clear. I'm not sectarian. But the point I'm trying to make is this is global. And a lot of the things this issue with the Roman Catholic Church is not just something uniquely German. It's not uniquely British. It's not uniquely American. They're all demonstrating this to some extent. And it helps reinforce their national identity or just contested terrain about their national identity. Mm -hmm. no, Sorry, that was kind of long-winded. So no, it was, it was a... That's someone else. Yeah. Oh. No, but I think Duncan is right in that the... Um, God, what I was thinking here it's it's a balancing act was it it's a challenging balancing act when do you provide too much detail about a foreign event and when do you not provide enough right it's um duncan pulled me back a few times and was like you need to explain this <laughs> when we read read each other's sections because he was like i i don't even know this one so you have to explain it to me and we did that to each other that there were sections where we didn't know what the other one was talking about and we mm -hmm. had to add material to explain it. Uh, so that that was beneficial in part. And I'm sure there will be some sections where a where reader will be like, oof, I don't know. It would have been nice to have a little glossary or something. And, yeah. But that's just the reality. I, I 
I would actually go even beyond what Duncan said with regard to perspective. I think mm -hmm. having grown up abroad very much changes and shapes this book because we don't come at the United States as this like we haven't been in elementary from elementary school engaged in flag waving activities, singing the national anthem at every sporting event, celebrated the Fourth of July all the time, right? We we haven't been in this we haven't had all that patriotic claptrap that Americans grow up with. And even if you are a scholar of the United States, it has an impact on you, right? Like it it just has an impact. It's it's subconscious. You you don't even realize it. Um, you know, that's it's just the reality of it. So it's as it is, I think, a benefit for us having that sort of personal distance to the United States that we could look at it a little bit more and be like, ooh, let's not put like I think it was Duncan's word choice of the United States is not the sun around it, what everything revolves. Um it it's it's multiple galaxies that are circulating through the through the ether here. Um, so, yeah, I think for both of us, it was not being born in the U.S. actually beneficial in the way we wrote the book. Yeah, uh, but and and that's it's very clear in the book. <laughs> um, I, I think that you know the the thread of the the book is obviously the American Civil War, um, mm -hmm. and it comes back. You know this is a book, when you're reading this book from, from start to finish, you know you're, you're reading a book about the American Civil War. What you've done is you've, the 19th century is a tapestry, and you have the American Civil War as a thread in mm -hmm. that larger tapestry. Um, and I, as you were talking, have there been any... Um, uh, hints about maybe having a translation of this book or translations of this book? No, no. But on the other hand, it's it's just come out, so I'm not surprised. Well, I mean, I wait to see what the reactions like for the move to translation. I mean, obviously, it'd be buys great. Buy the book. Buy the book. <laughs> yeah. No, but it'd be great if it was translated. Yeah. I mean, I suppose one thing people could legitimately complain, as we say, as Neil said, the the the. Uh, the U.S. is not the sun around which the other nations' planets orbit, but they'll say, wait a minute, the sun in this book is the American Civil War. How do you justify that? <laughs> I mean, but my response would be, you have to start from somewhere. You have to have some bandage from somewhere. You can't, you have to, it's the same way we interpret the world. We have to interpret it through ourselves. We've got nowhere else to start with. So there is that. Um, and I think yeah. it would be... Like, would some European readers be like, oh, pff, I already know all this. Yeah, sure. There will be some that where they will have no appeal. Well, there are going to be some global historians probably who will be like, oh, what's new here? You know, um, but I think in Europe. And I mean, Andrew, you can correct me since you are living in France and you can kind of speak more even to it i can speak from austria and german perspective there's an interest in u.s history um yeah. history is not like i just the last two weekends i was at book sales in in austria and in both cases the history section was marginal like we're talking like 20 30 books like it was it was it was a joke right like like there was a book i almost picked up and then i looked at the first page like oh it's a novel never mind um but it's the point here is there is an interest in U.S. history. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is written from Europeans who are writing for an audience that just gets the basics. You know, That's like right. that that twenty that two hundred page book on the American Civil War we laugh at because we're like, that's not quite right. That's not quite right. That's you're overlooking twins of details here. Yeah, uh, but for the maps that are approximate right. and <laughs> yeah um and i always think like i don't think we'll have time today to talk about it but maybe it's a future time we can uh the american west right like in the last two and a half weeks i have seen so many books with regard to native americans that want where i want to vomit i want to buy that book just to destroy it and not have it circulate here in austria because uh -huh. it's just it's so atrocious of how 
there's still sort of this, oh, all Native Americans wear bonnets and, te- and live in teepees. And you're kind of like, no, that is not the case. Um, so there's, there's still a lot of this very racist perception that w- obviously we don't deal with it in the book, but there there needs to be more, I think, American scholarship that needs to be translated, brought here to a general audience that well, the, the reason they get I, a better the, feeling. The, the, the reason I ask is because um, it seems that this book would um, invite readers of different origins. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, I don't think someone say... I think a Spanish volume would be brilliant to get more interest or, in Latin America. Or Portuguese. Yeah. Brazil. Mm-hmm. Um, because there, you've between the between the Spanish language um, of the former Spanish Empire and the former Portuguese Empire, you guys really um, a good portion of the book is on the Iberian yeah. Empire. Yeah, on purpose. <laughs> Well, yeah, but it's it, this is what interests me. You see, with the United States, it's actually, in some ways, the United States is a European-derived society, all right, mm-hmm. and that's where these settlers and immigrants come from. But on the other hand, it actually has a lot more in common with its Latin American neighbors than it does with Europe mm-hmm. on slavery and the abolition of slavery. Mm-hmm. Um, in the U.S., for the story of slavery and its abolition in the U.S. actually in some ways bears a much closer resemblance to Latin America than Europe. So it's one angle where the United States has actually got much more in common with its immediate geographical neighbors than it does with Europe. I don't think that's appreciated in the U.S. at all. I mean, maybe some scholars do, but not many. And I do think this is another aspect of the United States. This really is an Atlantic world the U.S. exists in. It's influencing and being influenced by multiple places. And in some ways, it's very close to Britain. In other ways, it's actually quite close to Brazil. And it's it, this kind of these kinds of connections I'm glad we we're able to highlight. Um, because I say this really is a transnational world. It's not, it's it's a global world, it's globalizing and it, it quite a clip. And I think that's important to bring that across as opposed to just focus strictly on the U.S. and Europe. Mm-hmm. And well, I'm about... kind of glad you're you're thinking that Latin America is that important in the book because I actually felt I would have liked a lot more of Latin America in there. Like, I mean, that's the constraints we had. <laughs> yeah. we, there was uh-huh. so many things we would have liked to, but we couldn't mm-hmm. because of time, space constraints. But yeah. um, I think that when you look at Latin American history, because that's where I've thinking about going in the future it's there's not a lot written right it's like there's a colonial period then there's the independence period and then they oftentimes immediately jump to the to the 20th century and kind of like the the cold war period the kind of uh, political instabilities that you have like racial questions gender questions in the 20th century um, urban development question labor questions and Sort of the 19th century is this odd absence, this void in Latin American scholarship. Like, uh, and it's also another thing that's weird. This is the Anglo American relations. There is an insane British American imperial rivalry going on in Latin America. Exactly. Um, it's so, I mean, Clayton Bulwer Treaty and all of that. It's not as if there's no, it's not as if, again, People of the time are people of the time are very aware of Latin America, mm-hmm. what's going on there, and why it's important. Yeah. And then you read present day histories; it's never referenced, even though, again, to the people who actually lived at the time, it was on their minds. They were paying very close attention to what was going on there. We talked about that earlier with the. Yeah. Well, you're, you're talking about you know, newspapers for, for, from the time with yeah. headlines on front, you know, front page headlines about Mexico, about Argentina, yeah. about Brazil. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes those little details too. Like I, yeah. I forget what it was, but I, I think it was like a South Carolina paper in Aiken, South Carolina, that had like this tiny little detail about like a Latin American, something in Latin America. I think it was Peru, and you're kind of like, 
small paper in South Carolina cares about this? Why? But it's there <clears throat> because they did care. Right? Yeah. It's not like there's there's this like right today, right? You look at a newspaper and it's like I have to go to page thirty to find like some news about a little thing happening yeah. in Latin America, I, I, but it's I, all there. I, I, with the 19th century, I'm talking about the educated people in the 19th century, whatever their vices were, insularity was not one of them. That's a good the, way to this, say these, the, No, these were people who were very much aware of the wider world in which their nation or their you know, mm -hmm. future nation was involved in. And, and you're not talking about just big cities, say New York, uh, mm -hmm. New Orleans, uh, no. San Francisco. You're talking about Provincial. Yeah. Provincial. Small towns yeah. ac across, even on the frontier. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Mm -hmm. No, that. Go ahead, Andrew. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> you know, I don't know how long you guys want to talk. That's the... uh, we could probably do another 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So throughout the book, um, of course, the American Civil War is is the theme. However, well, the American Civil War is a the theme, and you have, of course, Lincoln. You have Jefferson Davis, um, but you also have other protagon uh, other protagonists. Mm -hmm. Who are the main protagonists on the global stage? Who are <laughs> the the, mo the most influential? And, and part of what would be like, what's the tattoo historians is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, because we accidentally yeah. or unintentionally or very intentionally picked both the same person in that when he asked us. Um, and for both of us, it's Napoleon's assert, um, which I still believe. And like, I'm just, how about we phrase it that what's the second most important person? Okay. So, <laughs> of course, in, in the intro, I mean, you start with the New York Herald. Uh, the the biggest yeah, the biggest problem in Europe right now is Napoleon the third. Okay, that's it, and he comes. He's he's there from beginning to end. Uh, okay, so who's the well, second? He's one? just a man. He's just a man who has his fingers in so many pies. That's it. Yeah, and I think one thing I am happy about in this book, plus things I'm happy about, but certainly for both American and actually British readers, I'm glad we've kind of emphasize just how insignificant this man is because he's seen as a bit of a bad joke in both countries um with the u.s it's the disaster in mexico in britain it's because you know bismarck deals with him pretty mm -hmm. finely but that's all in hindsight mm -hmm. during his lifetime when he's active yeah he is absolutely significant very significant and you know, as we point to, in some ways, he indirectly is a man who lands the U.S. in Vietnam in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. I mean, his the impact of his reign is a long one. And it's one thing we detail we didn't have in the book was his son, his heir, was killed in the Anglo-Zulu War. He was traveling with British officers to observe the war, and they had the bad luck to run some Zulus, and the Zulus killed him. And this was a big Ouch. black eye for Britain. Yeah, big black eye for Britain. Big embarrassment for Britain because technically they were responsible for her safety. And yeah. this was after he'd been deposed, but that was his heir was actually killed in the Anglo-Zulu War. So again, it's it's just this massive stuff. But if we'll leave Napoleon III for a second and go with the second person, I'm going to let Niels go first. I, think uh, I go first this time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually am going to go with... And you guys are probably going to be a little weirded out because he's not much in the book, but I would actually put Leopold O'Donnell on on a very high position, the really? okay. prime minister of Spain, because during his he is like during his time. And again, we, we, can't, we didn't have much space for it, but it's during his time that. He gets that Spanish expedition into the Dominican Republic, that they join forces with the French in Mexico. Um, he kind of lays the foundation for this desire to reestablish the Spanish Empire in in Latin America, right? He he eventually you have that Spanish expedition against Peru over dubious causes. Um, 
the, the total failure, of course, for the Spanish. But it is all of those combined that kind of in Europe creates this moment of sort of like, you know, hmm, maybe Spain is a great power again. Maybe we need to take some serious again. Sort of like if Spain had been better, <laughs> he could have been somewhat like a Napoleon. Um, and I, I wanted to pick him here because I know Bismarck, Palmerston, Cavour are kind of the obvious choices as the next person. Um, and I, I don't want to do those. <laughs> I also don't want to go Garibaldi. Um, I think Garibaldi, especially recently in U.S. scholarship, is way overrated. Um, yes, he is a very much important nationalist figure. But much of it happens at the behest of those sponsoring him, right? Like if the Italian king doesn't want him to do something, he doesn't get to do it. That's the reality of it. That's when he invades mm -hmm. Rome, you know, like he is, like he has his own ideas. Um, like, but yeah, I, I, I go with O'Donnell because I think in many ways, when we think of the Americas, he has a very important influence that needs more flashing out. I'm totally surprised by that. Yeah, I wanted to do something uh, surprising. Totally surprised. Uh, Duncan, what do you think? I'm going to be uh, a lot more conservative. I'm going to go with that beautiful failure, Louis Cassou. Oh. Um, the, Louis, Louis, or Lajos is the real name, but Louis, I'm going to call him. This guy is a global phenomenon, and he actually fails. He fails completely and utterly. Mm -hmm. And yet he is a, I use this term advisedly, I know it's a cliche, but he is a rock star. He, I mean, he is just, he's huge in the United States. He comes across and visits, you know, Lincoln, they they, they create this thing called a Kasuth hat, which is basically a mimic, it's, it's sort of like that. It's, there's nothing special about his hat, but an ent entrepreneurial American tailor makes this hat that looks like the one he's wearing. It's called a Kasuth hat. This is a bestseller in the United States. Lots of young men are walking around these Kasuth hats. It's it's incredible. And Lincoln apparently buys one and wears this Kasuth hat at various gatherings. So the Scotch bonnet that was misidentified when he's going to be inaugurated as president is probably a Kasuth hat, not a Scotch bonnet at all. It's, you know, boys, uh, Baltimore. And he's also huge in Britain. You know, all these crowds mm -hmm. of hundreds of thousands of people come out to see this guy. And it's, he's just, and he, he gets away with incredible stuff. Like when he's in the U.S., he openly tells the Americans that he wants them to come and help liberate Hungary. That this idea of staying in the Americas and not, you know, getting involved in European affairs is a backward idea. It may have been correct in the days of Washington, but it's no longer correct. Now, you'd expect this would have, this would cause him to have rotten fruit thrown at him in the United States. No, the crowds like cheer and celebrate. What a, this sounds great, guys. I find this astonishing that, that when you look at Kasuth, how he becomes this great like liberal hope, this great national hope, and he is actually a complete and utter failure. Yeah. Two people, though, who are utterly immune to his charms are Queen Victoria in England and Millard Fillmore in the United States. They both despise Kasuth, and they are really angry that their you know respective peoples love him. And, you know, yeah, Queen Victoria forbids her ministers to meet with him. She despised him so much. Miller Filmer has to have his arm twisted to a, have a meeting with Kasuth in the White House. And Miller Filmer actually says, if he makes a speech at me, he's going to be thrown out. So, <laughs> yeah. I, so this, is, this is one of these fellows who nowadays, most people, certainly in the English world, really don't know who he is or they've vaguely heard of him. But in his day, he was just... Yeah, he was just a mega star, even bigger, I would say, than Garibaldi. And it's amazing because he is actually, he fails utterly. I mean, it's by the end of the 19th century, it's Austria-Hungary. And yeah, Hungarian nationalism looks pretty dead without the First World War. Well, so and, I, and, yeah. and secession and, and attempted secession and independence of, of Hungary and... Uh, well, I think well, the funny part here is that we like we picked Louis Napoleon on a different podcast. You picked Kosus here. I picked O'Donnell here. Um, we avoided the guys that we remember. 
you know that like Bismarck is not one that we pick here. Lincoln is not one we pick here. Yeah. Uh, I you think that you speaks... don't pick Metternich either. Metternich. Well, no, we're not picking Metternich. <laughs> well, oh, but, no, no. Uh, but when you talk when you talk in the book about about the stability of of Vienna and that being challenged right. by who other who else but Napoleon the yeah. Third. Yeah. Um, but I think that speaks to kind of also this notion, right? That who we remember today in their own time were big, but there were others who rivaled them. But because like Napoleon fails on some level, Kosuth fails on some level, O'Donnell fails on some level, we don't remember them as much. Yeah. Um, they kind of, as more characters arise, somebody has to go. And these are the characters that go kind of like a, uh, kind of a B-list cast, if I can use that word from a friend of mine that writes about B-list histor uh, historical figures. And, you know, that's just the nature of sex. Uh, yeah. uh, I yeah, think that's... Is, yeah. Go ahead. But we kind of demonstrate that in the conclusion, don't we, with mm -hmm. Woodrow Wilson. That's right. Yeah. I mean, this. I'm, I'm 55 years old. When I was a kid, Woodrow Wilson was a great American president, full stop. Mm -hmm. And he was actually a liberal icon. Nowadays, he has seriously fallen from grace because of his racial views. And that's not wrong, but it's very interesting how, you know, in the early, you know, certainly in the 20th century, mm -hmm. this was one of the great American presidents. And now, mm -mm, not so much. It's how people's reputations fluctuate is actually quite remarkable yeah. um, and where they actually fit in their importance in history. It requires a lot of hindsight, actually, to mm -hmm. ultimately decide where they end up, and it's it's it is interesting. Well, and I think that's sort of the goal of the memory chapter too, right? That we wanted mm -hmm. to kind of illustrate that we all know about the various aspects of like, the books over there behind me that deal with Civil War memory, um, mm -hmm. but we haven't done that in a lot of other places. As a places, the same kind of attention being paid to how do we remember it. And that's the selection that, as we imagine a national community happens, like we pick who we want to be as a hero. Germans pick Bismarck, and he was very fundamental in crafting that legacy himself. Uh, Americans picked, in the North, Lincoln as the emancipator, right? In mm -hmm. the South, Confederates picked their little heroes, um, or worse, mostly. Um, and in every country, they did that in some form, right? Like Mexico, and, pick... and then Lord Palmerston in Britain is one of like, three <laughs> British historians who, uh, three British historians, three British prime ministers who have received a state funeral. Right. Duke of Wellington, Winston Churchill. You can guess why those guys got their state funeral. Yep. Lord Palmerston. Mm -hmm. Wow. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's there's only three British prime ministers who had a formal state funeral. Oh, wow. And Lord Palmerston is one of the three. Now again, Churchill and Duke of Wellington, you know why. Yeah. With Palmerston, you're like, well, that's in retrospect very strange because he's simply not a giant in British history like those two are. But people at the time, even in Victoria, for instance, disliked him intensely. Nonetheless, he still got a state funeral. So it's it is interesting. It's, it's no, but it, on part I would say it makes sense. I mean, God, the man is in politics for sixty years. <laughs> Like, if there is a, he, he, he yeah. fought Napoleon and fought Napoleon the second time in a different yeah, iteration. Yeah, but he's not. He simply, but in British history, in retrospect, he's not as consequential as either Churchill or the Iron Duke. I mean, it just no. If you have a hard place to make that argument, yeah. But well, it's, it's uh, he is one of the three. Yeah, crazy. So, if we were to slowly wrap up. Um, hmm. One question to bring it back to the Civil War, to the American Civil War. Where, uh, where would you place the United States at the time, the Confederacy, rebellion, Confederate States of America, uh, in the age of nationalism? Ooh. What is their place in the age of nationalism? I would... I'm going to take a stab at legitimacy it. of causes. Yeah. I, um, I'll take a stab at yeah. it. <laughs> That's a good question. It's a tough one. 
I would I don't see it as a Finnish nation, right? I think after the Civil War we're going to start talking more about it as a Finnish nation, but I don't see it in at the time of the outbreak of of the war in 1861. I don't see it as a, as a Finnish nation. And in that it fits with pretty much every nation in the in 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 the Americas for sure. Right, none of them has figured out yet who we are, how to best govern ourselves, what's the best structure of government. Um, so in that, I think the United States is, and Duncan said that earlier, is very similar to most nations in the Americas, um, some in Europe as well. Right, like. We could look at France, Italy, Spain, Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the same would apply. Like They don't have to find themselves yet fully. So in that, I think that's, that's the crux of the book, right? They are still trying to figure out who they are. And the United States is struggling through a civil war in part to do that, um, some countries don't have to go through a civil war, but maybe a foreign war to do that. Yeah, and I'm going to be slightly cynical here and just say this outright. If the Confederate States had won their independence, okay, which was by no means impossible, mm -hmm. um, it would have been a viable nation state. Yeah. It wouldn't have just been a very pleasant nation state, but it would have been a nation state. And what you'd have had was, you know, you'd have had in North America, you'd have had Canada, the United States, the Confederate States, and Mexico. Mm -hmm. And obviously the world would be very different, but, um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dismiss Southern nationalism as fraudulent or anything like that. It obviously was a question they failed. Mm -hmm. Then there's reconstruction and they rewrite some of the verdict. We all know how that pans out. But this is, I mean, there's no reason not to regard the Southern states as a nationalist movement. All right. And that doesn't care for confer approval. It just says this, you know, just dismissing as rebels doesn't really cut it. Yeah. There is a possible national identity, a possible creation of a new nation in the Americas should they succeed. They don't. And this is where I, this is why I say, yeah, the United States, to echo just what Neil said, it is an unfinished nation. Mm -hmm. And this question of whether or not it's a union or a nation proper is, it's still in the balance at this point. So the United it's, States, yes, is very definitely nation engaged, in nation building. Yeah. Well, and, it, again, hence um, the, the, I was going to say, the, 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 the change from the idea of, of union to the idea of nation. Mm -hmm. over the course of the war. I would actually venture to kind of argue that if we think of the North or and the South as sort of nations, I would actually say the South has a much better and clearer and widespread, even if it's not everyone buying into it, obviously, 50% or a third of the South definitely doesn't, but um, even the other two thirds probably not uh, as universal, but I would say the South has a much more well-defined national identity than the Northern states have, right? Mm -hmm. Because as a result of nullification and Calhoun, we have the start of that identification, the imagining of what it means to be Southern that the Northern states just haven't gone through as sort of, they don't have mm -hmm. that ideologue that stands there and is like, this is what it means to be from this mm. section of the country. Yes, it ties to slavery, interpretations yeah. of the Constitution, interpretations of the founders, but they are they have a head start in many ways. Mm. And I would say, by the way, you know, just to move away from the south of the United States, let's just go up north to Canada. I would actually argue French Canadians in Quebec actually have a national identity long before Canadians do. They have a much more identifiable national sense of as a distinct people in a distinct territory than English-speaking Canada. Mm -hmm. English-speaking Canada is really just a bunch of British colonists, to be I 
don't want to be dismissive, but that's really what they are at this time. Whereas the Quebec, the French Canadian sees himself as an actual distinct unified people. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting in some of these places now, people talk about Canadians, they think about English speaking Canada. Most people don't really think much about Quebec at all. But in fact, in some ways, they, they're ahead. Of, and I would go, actually go as far as say, the actual Canadian identity, the first Canadians, actually Canadians, really are French Canadians. Yes. They're not English speaking Canadians at all. They only become, they actually are Johnny Come Lately's adopting the Canadian identity. The French Canadians have it first. And indeed, the term Canadian was originally Canadian, French. So it's, it's interesting, some of these nation states, there's parts of them that are actually already nations first. And I, I tend to agree with what Niels has just said. But it, you can see this in other places as well. Mm-hmm. That, that was where I wanted to um, get to. Uh, legitimacy of the, of the Confederacy mm-hmm. and, the, and the Southern nation. Oh yeah, that's a good one, right? That I, I think diplomatic historians are still debating that in many ways. Of mm-hmm. Like, is, are they legitimate or not? I mean, well, like, but when when yeah. you when you put it in the context of the age of nationalism, there's no, no reason why they shouldn't. Right. But I think that's what we outline very clearly in the intervention chapter: is that it's like you may be a nation, you may perceive of yourself as a nation, you may have. A government in something of a state boundary, it does not mean that other countries will recognize you as another state, mm-hmm. right? That there's too much danger, too much precedent, too much war and politics that could result from that kind of a decision. And this is something I think far too many Civil War historians miss, that for much of the world, looking at the American Civil War, all of these nations have their own independence movements they're having to deal with, and they're not actually that thrilled about cheering on the Confederacy or cheering on any insurgency movement anywhere. Because they've all, at some point or another, dealing with their own insurgency movements or mm-hmm. people who are rejecting the national destiny. And in some ways, the Confederacy is very unwelcome to the powers that be across the world because it's just another rebellion and they see it less so much about slavery or a test to the test democracy and these other you know myths are going around they see it as a great here's another group of people you know kicking up a ruckus and undermining an established government I mean, uh-huh. it's like Britain, right? How do you say to the Irish, you can't be free if you support the Confederacy? <laughs> the Russians remember the Poles. Yeah. Yeah. Austria remembers the Hungarians. Mm-hmm. They all have. Spain got, has Cuba. You know? Spain has Cuba. And they do see things through that perspective. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. and then the misreading of, of geopolitics by. The Confederacy. Oh, uh, yeah. But most oh, yes. of it, um, it's not the 1770s means, anymore. Exactly. No. Recognition means yeah. intervention. Yeah. Yeah. Aid and independence. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's no, not going to happen. South, the South catastrophically misreads things. I mean, even their assumption that all they have to do is withdraw, withhold their cotton crop, yeah. and Britain will attack the United States in order to get it. No one does that. Sorry? No one does that, right? Like, no. It's too costly to go to war. Rather, like What they do during the Civil War? They rather pay the workers in Lancashire a little money so that they can survive than go to war because it's cheaper it's, than going to just, war. Yeah, but it's not just that. British investments in the United States, the North, the dwarf yeah. those of the South. The, the actual United States of America is a more valuable market. Yeah. It, it's, it's, the, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's actually kind of, but Louis Cassou, you know, miscalculates. Yeah. So, so does, so does Louis Napoleon. I mean, there's miscalculations. That, that too is just a fact of history, isn't it? I mean, okay. there's a lot of those. I know. Yeah. Well, it's great to have the perspective of, 
putting those misunderstandings and misreadings mm-hmm. into a yeah a, a more global context context you can appreciate things um, the, you can appreciate the 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 contours and the relief of um, an insular history that there's a history that's often studied in an insular fashion. Yeah. That's the goal. Yeah, very much so. so that's it. Yeah. Well, um, I don't know how long we've been on, but about I think an hour and a half. So I say we can probably wrap it. Yeah, we can. I say we're good. Well, so. um, we'll probably do more, huh? <laughs> I think. Well, there's a lot to talk about. Yes, that Indeed. really showed today. Um, so, so again, let's just do the is... thank yous and then. Yeah, well, so this um, here talking about their new book, "The Civil War in the Age of Nationalism." Um, LSU Press, twenty twenty four. Are Niels Eichhorn and Duncan A. Campbell. I want to thank very much for uh, inviting me to be on this uh, podcast as a guest interviewer. I've had a really good time chatting with you guys. Um, you. And I can't uh, recommend this book highly enough. <laughs>